life is weirdly a lot harder than we've been told. And midlife? That's a whole other can of worms that I was completely unprepared for. What about you? But here's the good news. There are so many new skills and mindsets that we can learn to make even the toughest days a little bit better. You just haven't learned them. Welcome to Thrive with Kira, a smart and scary podcast for women in midlife that teaches the skills to get more joy and love in your life. Join me weekly as I teach science-based smarty farty topics and break them down into bite-sized lessons that you can apply to your life, all while sharing my own shit show life stories that you can learn from. I'll be talking regularly about getting more joy on a daily basis, thriving in midlife, yes, you can, figuring out menopause, healthy dating and relationships, building self-worth, body positivity and neutrality, growth mindset, adult friendships, and also just easy mindfulness. So we can stop just surviving and start learning how to thrive. Welcome to Thrive. Hello there, sugar pantses. How are you doing? Happy Friday. Woo! It has been a week. You know what though? How many weeks have I said that? And better question is how many weeks have you thought that too? Who hears me? Lots going on in the world. I'm not going to comment on a ton of them because I have a much better podcast today than to discuss the state of our nation. But I want to share something with you really quickly and then tell you about one of my literal favorite people on this earth. And he came and talked to me for this podcast and I could not be more excited. But first things first, I have... I think exciting news. This is, that's the way I'm going to say it. I don't know everything. Even after 16 years of doing this work, of teaching this work, of coaching around this work, specifically positive psychology, that's been the last 10, I would say eight to 10. I still don't always get the business part of this right. Boy, do I wish I did, but I don't. And I, as we know, threw myself very dramatically. Please picture me in some kind of Renaissance gear feverishly writing with a quill. But I sat down and created a whole new program, the Thrive Program. I've been talking about this on this podcast a lot. I was so excited about it. I was ready to get it out there in May. And then there was some delays. I could not get the, the retreat place changed twice. Then we had... Then I had some technical difficulties which happened. And so by the time I got it out there, it was late June, right before July 4th and, and Canada Day, because I'm going to be saying something very special about Canada today. And so by the time it got out there, the people I've been talking to for years, some of them were like, this looks great. Maybe I'm going to aim for next year. But I did hear a lot of, Kira, I don't have paid time off. He <laughs> left this year. Or I already have things planned for this fall. And I will tell you, I live in a very weird little isolated world running this business and I forget about that shit. And I just think that it was not my intention, but I maybe just rushed this because this is a much kind of longer and bigger and more comprehensive program than I've ever run before. I talked to some people, I talked to my guest experts, I talked to everybody, and I've decided to push Thrive back to the new year. So that hopefully it makes it allows a few more people to come through the door who have now more vacation time, will have a little bit more time to either save up. And now I can do an actual 10 part payment plan. So this might feel really doable for a lot more people. But I just wanted to come over here and say, I don't know everything. And even though I come on and I think I can talk really confidently on quite a few things at this point. I don't know everything and I still make mistakes all the time. It's just sometimes frustrating, disappointing, and I blame my ADHD and I blame other things, but I'm always just doing the best that I can. Here's a couple of changes that are going to happen. First of all, it'll start January 1st, just like it was going to start September 1st. So the whole thing has just been pushed back four months. January 17th to 23rd, we are going to go to Mexico. So now, that you're going to spend a week in Mexico in January. 
when you need it. I get it. I really, Danny and I were discussed this for a whole day. And he's, but don't you want to go to Mexico for a week in January? I know I do. And I'm like, hell yeah, I do. So that's the first great thing. It'll be set up just like the rest of the program. Then weekly calls kick in starting in February. The biggest change is that we are doing the optional kind of mini retreat, which is just a long weekend for people to see each other in community and see me and have some fun together because long programs can have a little lull and you're just, uh. so it's great to get that refresher. And I'm pretty excited about where I've chosen to go. And it's in fucking Canada, everybody. This originally was supposed to be in Palm Springs because Palm Springs in January is great. Palm Springs is hot as fuck in the summer. And as a 51-year-old woman with perimenopause, I don't want to be hot as fuck anymore. So we are going to, I have no, I literally just put my hand up to my mouth. I'm fucking ridiculous. We're going to Quebec City everybody. And I'm so fucking excited. Have you guys ever been to Quebec City? I did on cruise ships. I got to do a really cool run when I worked for Holland America Line. And I took it for one reason and one reason alone. And I feel like the fellow maybe Gen Xers, some millennials, but I feel like this is hardcore Gen X because it came out, I want to say 86, 85. But forwards. Anne of Green Gables. That's right. I took actually a whole six month contract when I worked on cruise ships just to do six weeks of a run going from Boston to Montreal so I could go to see Prince Edward Island. But one of the little surprise gems of that, and I actually enjoyed a lot of the stops that we went to. I thought Nova Scotia is adorable. And I think Montreal is a super cool city. We got to go to Maine. So it was a really fun run. I wasn't expecting it, but it really was. I'm getting to the point here. But there was this little gem that became my favorite weekly place to get off, wander around, stop in the coffee shops, there's it's got this old section that's all old buildings and it's just shops and the cutest fucking thing in the whole wide world and it's Quebec City and if you haven't been there it's the capital of the province of Quebec am I impressing my Canadian listeners because I'm really trying here and not only that it is I think the oldest city or one of the oldest cities in Canada I think 1600 I've watched now more than a few YouTube to get some ideas here and stuff like that because I used to just get off for the day and eat poutine because that's what you fucking do and it was just it's like a little slice of Europe right in North America and it's just adorable and in the summer there's a waterfall, there's a river. It's just cool. And we're just going to walk around and explore and have great food and great conversations. I'm really excited about this. It's actually a really fun change because this all happened when Danny had his days off this week. So he dug in with me and I'm like, where do we go? Where do we go in like late May, early June? Because that's not Palm Springs anymore. And we talked a lot of places. I didn't want to go back to Mexico because we were already going there. And he's what about Canada? And I'm like, what about Canada? Let's go to Canada. And boom, there it is. And it's great. And it's pretty affordable. So I'm really excited. Anyway, I'm not going to go all into it. But I did want to say that there are some changes. And I think it might loosen up for some people with budgets as well as timing so that you can join me. I really encourage you to go check it out, thrivewithkira.com. At least look through it. Share it with people. Yes, it's pricey, but the value is fucking there. I can't even say it. And the transformation and the life changes there if you need to work on your self-worth because there's going to be such nine months of self-worth work. I'm not even joking. Nine months. It's going to start from the beginning. And it's also going to start from the beginning of just emotional regulation and feeling better and all of this stuff. It's going to be so great. And we just get to spend nine months together. And and I just reminded somebody today, you get to contact me every day, like within reason, of course. But Monday through Friday, you get access to me, my brain. So if you're dating, that's cool. You have access to my brain. All my dating information is still in there. I'm just not talking about right now on this podcast. 
So anyway, I hope you check it out. Even if it's not for you this year, let me know. I'll get you on the list so that you're first to know for next year. And please share it with your friends because I know we've already got a couple people. Luckily, we're able to move to January. But I know that there is for 10 more women out there this is going to be the right match for them. So I'm asking a favor. If it's not for you, that's cool. But share it with other people because I know there are so many women in midlife who are just really struggling right now. And this work can change their lives. And you don't have to take just my word for it. And that's exactly part of the reason I brought my friend Rob Mack on. So let me introduce Rob Mack. Rob Mack, I have known him now for 15 years. I've known him longer than I've known Danny. He and I were supposed to do a singles cruise together as experts and the person who was putting it together flaked on it and we were like bummer but we stayed in touch and we became great friends and throughout the years I have had some of the best does everybody have a friend like this if you don't I think it's worth seeking out just sit down and have the best deepest smartest conversations about life, about relationships, about the world and what's happening and why it's happening and everything else. And I've always thought of him as a bit of a Yoda, a little bit of a Buddha. He just sees the world from a different perspective compared to most, including myself. I'm there sometimes. I'm there sometimes, but not all the time, because there's certainly been a lot of swear words out of my mouth about our world. So I'm not perfect. But he was the one who told me about positive psychology. Call that I reference here that we did in 2011 changed my trajectory. It absolutely did. When I talked to him and started talk to, talking to him more about happiness, about positive psychology, like my mind was blown. The science, the research, like what they were saying. And it, it changed my life. And it made... What's already hard in this time, just easier because I know how to I know how to cope. I know how to get through shit. I know how to talk to people about what I'm going through. I know how to take care of myself and set boundaries with people on where my energy levels are. This work is a beautiful gift to not only ourselves, but to everybody in our lives. And for all of the moms out there, learning mindfulness, learning meditation, self-worth, learning self-compassion understanding all of it and not just in your head but in your body and through your voice through your actual skills and mindsets and what you do and how you say that is a beautiful fucking gift for your kids I'm just throwing that out there but Rob Mack is here he's in the program he's in all of my programs he's so fucking nice that he comes and talks at, in every one of my programs he's always a uh, <laughs> program favorite more than me some of the times which, which I've had to work through but without further ado meet Rob Mack and I think you're gonna love this conversation as much as I do okay everybody meet my favorite fucking person next to Danny <laughs> probably and he even knows this Rob Mack thank you oh, for coming Rob thanks so much for having me you know I love talking to you here and I will be honest everybody this will be different than any other guest podcast because Rob and I know each other quite well, but we love to go deep quickly, we but we're ready to break down what the fuck is wrong with the world right now, why we're all so unhappy, and Rob and I both have a secret or a key that nobody else seems to know about, or like 90% of our population doesn't seem to know about, and the reason that I got into positive psychology is because in 2011, I remember the day. In 2011, you and I did a group call for one of my programs back then, and you told me that 10% of our happiness comes from external. Yes. And I was like, sat there for the rest of that call or maybe the rest of the week and went, what? And so I wanted to bring him on. I wanted both of us to have a conversation about what we see happening with people right now and then what are some of the things we can actually do about it because we can't control the world we can't control our neighbor we can't control so many people around us but there are things we can control and things that we can do and that's what we're going to talk about i'm blown away you remember 2011 can't remember not yesterday. much <laughs> not much that's how mind-blowing my calls are always with you i actually have 
moments in my mind of even just you and I on phone calls and like where I am in that moment because you said something so profound Ooh. that it changed my life. That That's really the kind so of person. Mutual. Kira, I really appreciate you saying that. Thank you. And I have to reciprocate that because I've had the most impactful conversations with you ever and I have them consistently. And I always walk away with shivers like, wow, that's exactly what I needed to hear on that exact day, that exact time from you, especially from you, because you're able to say things in a way that nobody else does. Let me tell you why I love to hang out with Rob Mack besides he's like the smartest person I know is because you're such a fucking kind and complimentary and giving person. It's so inspiring. Sometimes I say to myself, what would Rob Mack do? In this <laughs> what would Rob Mack say in this moment? Step outside of my own bias or my own bullshit and go, what's the bigger picture here? Mm -hmm. You've right? been that way. Yes. I appreciate you saying that's hard. I'm working on still receiving. I appreciate you sharing that. And from the very beginning, the only light attracts light, right? And it takes light to recognize light. And Kira, you've been that way with me and with everyone you've served whether it's friends or family or clients from the very beginning, really, Matt. So since the very first day we met, I think, in fact, one of the first conversations was about like how you could help me and we were going to partner on if it's a cruise or something. And it was fantastic mm -hmm. from the very first moment. So thanks for saying that. And also you couldn't recognize that unless you were that. All right. See, I really just bring people on to make me feel good about myself. That's <laughs> what this stroke. is. That's what this is. But so Rob has been talking about, Rob has his master's in applied positive psychology. He wrote the book, Happiness from the Inside Out, and has written, you are so prolific in your writing. I cannot get even a blog out anymore, an article out anymore. I'm over it. This is my medium. But I think we are struggling almost more than ever. And maybe that is just a perspective that's not even a realistic perspective. But what are you seeing, Rob? What are you seeing, particularly in the American culture or just... You can't go online without seeing just anger and sadness and fear and so many emotions right now. Yeah. And everybody believing that what they think is the right way and the only right way. Yeah, you nailed it. People are looking for happiness in all the wrong places. They're looking for love in all the wrong places. Yep. We've all been guilty of that. I've been the most guilty. That's why I do the work that I do. That's number one. And there are different expressions and manifestations of that. People are overwhelmed mm -hmm. and they're overwhelmed with a lot of external things and stimuli and pieces of information, news updates and concerns and things they should worry about all coming at them. And most of us haven't been taught how to process any or all of that information as quickly as it's coming in. We don't know oh, what to do sure. with it, right? And so we become increasingly focused on uncontrollable things and therefore don't focus on the few things that are controllable. And the more we do that, the more we outsource our power and our peace and our happiness and our love. And it just becomes a vicious sort of cycle and circle. The more uncontrollable things feel, the more you focus on what's uncontrollable, the more uncontrolled you feel yourself. And so we become increasingly emotionally dysregulated because we focus on things that aren't easily regulated instead of the emotions and the thoughts that can be. And I think that you're saying something so important right now. And I also think you being a fellow Gen Xer, because Rob and I are close to the same age, I'm older. I've been talking about how I just think our generation and the way that we were raised has its own level of complications of getting a little bit older. And I'm seeing a lot of what you just mentioned, processing information. I feel like because of the time that we grew up, and usually having both parents out of the home working, we'd have these things happen to us and nobody was there to talk it through with us. That's right. For the most part, we just tried to figure it out on our own. <laughs> and um, a lot of our parents were working too many hours and also they hadn't been taught how to do any of it. Sure. We were just taught to just stuff it down and compartmentalize or take it out on each other or whatever. And uh, yeah, so we feel like I think lots of us that we had to learn on our own. Thank mm -hmm. God there were people out there in the world who were dedicated to the cause and the mission of emotional regulation and self-soothing and cognitive reframing and all that good stuff that you teach all the time in all your programs, especially in Thrive. But it's, yes, it's learnable, it's teachable. You do have to really want it and you do right. have to invest in it. Absolutely. And I think that's, you and I both know that happiness as a destination, I think is one of the biggest things plaguing us at this yes. point. 
right? This idea that when we get to that perfect relationship, that perfect job, that this, that whatever it is, that all of a sudden then we will be happy. And that is now being completely proven to be bullshit. And yes. you were one of the first people who taught me that. So if that's not true, if us finally getting supposedly the love of our lives or the perfect job that we wanted or we've now moved to our dream place. And if that doesn't work, what the fuck does? Now, I know, but I want you to say it. <laughs> you say it so much better than I do. No, it's you nailed it. The two chief misconceptions around happiness. You could also argue they're true around love or peace or anything else you want. Truth. Right. Is that it exists somewhere other than here and now. And it exists in somebody or something else other than myself. Right? Or that's ourselves. Or ourselves. Or that's right. Absolutely. That's right. So the truth is that happiness is here and now. What I mean by that, and it's within you and only you. And science supports that. Scientists don't subscribe mostly to spiritual platitudes, but it just so happens that a lot of that scientific truth that we're discovering in the last 20 plus years or so do align with a lot of the spiritual platitudes that you hear Absolutely. out there in the world, right? Happiness is inside job, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So that's the truth. And one way to think about it is if you think about happiness or even peace, like honesty or like curiosity or like creativity or like kindness, it, you can think of it like a quality that exists within you at all points in time. Sometimes you decide or choose to tap into it and sometimes you simply don't. And most of us choose not to, but we don't always do it consciously. That's, I think, the point. Yeah. Right? You're distracted. Yes. Highly distracted. In The Course in Miracles, there's a great quote which says, you accomplish so little because of undisciplined minds. And that, I think, mm. is one of the root problem and challenge these days. We're all highly distracted, very rarely, if ever, present. Don't even know what it means to be present. And so that, in and of itself, makes it impossible to be happy because we're looking for it somewhere or some other place than where it actually exists and lives. Which is in us. I just have to tell you this because it's amazing how long we've known each other, how little we sometimes talk, and how big of an impact you've had on me, the work that I do, and the work that I do with others. And one of the things that Rob told me years and years ago about happiness, and I don't see other people talk about this way, and I've totally stolen it from you, and I need you to know that, and I feel mildly bad, but I know you're going to be okay with it. <laughs> we share our but minds. It's not stealing. Yeah. So the way that you've described happiness in the most beautiful way is that happiness isn't somewhere else. There's no way we can just land on it and then we're happy. It's literally just being able to be present enough and adjust our mindset enough that we can see these moments of joy every day. Absolutely. And these moments of joy turn into what happiness is then for us, right? We feel happier because we are present enough and can notice these moments of joy that are literally happening all day, every day around us. But we're so distracted. We're all working fucking way too hard for who knows what. We now have politics and aging and so many other things going on. But I even believe that in love. And I taught that as love for years, which is there's no time or place that you're going to get to a, an unconditional love that lasts forever and ever. Instead, you have to be connected enough, vulnerable enough, trusting enough that you can feel your moments of love with your partner at any time. So that turns into a long-term loving relationship. Absolutely. Um, We're basically changing the world right here, right now on this fucking podcast. Right. I feel if people just believed in those two ideas and applied them, we would have a completely different world. Yeah. Could you repeat those again? Repeat them again because I want to hear them again. Do yeah. you really? Yeah, I do. Genuinely. Okay. Yeah. yeah well, do you I'm, not say this and I've just made it up all these no, years? I like to hear, you? I can hear the way you say it because it's different from the way I say it. There's a particular Kira Saban spin on it that I think is powerful. Does it have the word fuck in it? Is that the Kira Probably. Saban spin? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. That's, otherwise, I wouldn't. That's the patented, the patented you've got on it. Yes. But this is the way I say it. That for joy, there is no happiness. There is no destination. But what we do is we get present enough. So we are noticing things. We're noticing when we go outside that beautiful tree that is now the leaves are turning. And we're noticing that kind moment that happened that maybe we would have missed. So you have to be present enough. And you have to also just have your perspectives in alignment enough. So we don't see everything through 
constant thinking traps or biases that make us feel like shit. Those are the two things for me that can really help us notice those moments of joy. And those Absolutely. moments of joy is connected equals happiness on love on some absolutely. level absolutely. and the same thing is with love yeah absolutely happiness is presence mm -hmm. and this is also innocence so sometimes people say ignorance is bliss we're not saying that we're saying innocence is bliss ignorance is not knowing you're ignorant innocent <laughs> is knowing you're ignorant that there may be a few things that you think you know and lo and behold you wait long enough you'll probably be wrong about even those things and yep. so it's learning to look at life and people and experience life and people without interpretation, without evaluation, without judgment, and without all of this commentary and obsessive compulsive thinking that pollutes every single mm. present moment and projects happiness into the past or the future and therefore causes you to chase a horizon that you will never ever reach. So happiness is presence. Another word for presence is innocence. Another word for is innocence is awareness or consciousness. But it's unconditioned consciousness. It's thoughtless, wordless awareness. It's pure presence, right? So it's like looking at life through the eyes of a child. That's why we loved being kids. That those moments when we could just sit on the on the beach, or we could just sit with our little puppy, and we had no thoughts, no abstract thoughts, no that prefrontal cortex wasn't all lit up, it wasn't even fully developed yet. You could just enjoy a shower for its own sake. You can just enjoy holding somebody's hand for its own sake. No thoughts about whether the relationship was going to last. No thoughts about whether the mortgage was going to get paid or the car payment was going to get paid. Just that moment, fully immersed in the moment. And that's also where you can have little disagreements with friends and five minutes later, be best friends again. But be enemies for 30 seconds and then best friends again. Because you didn't get locked up and lost in a mind and in thinking, consistently convinced you that everything you wanted was somewhere else and some time else. Yes. Do you agree? Because this is a, a, a major blanket statement, but I, I think that you and I both agree on this, that really joy, which is my favorite word, honestly, over happiness, because I just think something about joy is so amazing and precious. And sometimes we have a hard time remembering a time where we were really happy for a long time, but we all can remember a moment of, that we felt joyful recently. And that has to be in the present. It doesn't exist in the future and it can't exist in the past. And we can have a nice memory or moment, but you're still in that That's moment right. having that memory. That's right. But we keep looking for happiness in everything else but us because shit, how hard is it that first time you find out that happiness yeah. is in you? Oh my God, the first time I found out, I was like, oh, yeah. are yeah. you kidding me? Like I have to be in charge of myself? Yeah. That's the worst. Well, well, that's it right there. You hit it, which is that if you're responsible for your own happiness, it means you're also responsible for your own unhappiness, right? Mm. It's easier um, and more seductive to blame other people or things for un your unhappiness or for your distress or your anxiety or your overwhelm or your depression. It's easier and it's understandable. It's just not helpful and it's not enjoyable. And when you do that, when you blame anybody or anything else for how you feel, you also give them credit or give them the power to do anything about it. So you've disempowered yourself in the very moment you've blamed wow. anybody or anything yep. for how you feel, good, bad, or indifferent. So I try not to do that. Sometimes I'll use words that will let people know how much I appreciate them and it will sound like they've made me happy, but deep on the inside, I'm crystal clear. I feel happy because of the way in which I'm seeing and experiencing this person, which is all up to me. Yep. That doesn't mean that programming conditioning and those things don't influence that, they do. But still, you have a lot more power and control than you think you do. And scientists, again, say that 90% at very least is up to you. I'd say more than that, I'd say practically 100%. But at the very least, even among the most skeptical and cynical scientists in the world will say 90% of happiness is totally up to you, regardless of how much money you make, what age you are, what health you're in, how beautiful you think you aren't. This is something you can have an experience of every moment of every day. In fact, they'd say that you do have an experience of it. It's just that sometimes you're aware of that experience of it, and sometimes you're not. And I think most of us aren't because we are really working from that automatic system in our brain that just put, pushes us through the day every day. And I'm really sad. I spend plenty of time on social media just because I'm posting things and I'm seeing what else is out there and for my own entertainment. And there's so many posts on people like not even wanting to see their friends, not even wanting to do things on the weekend or in the evenings, not even wanting to go anywhere. And I think that now we're just like, oh, I'm feeling some social anxiety or I'm an introvert. And I'm like, but that doesn't mean you don't still need community. 
that doesn't mean that we still don't need things in our life that fill us up and, and, and give back. And I think that we are exhausting ourselves because we don't know these things to the point where we don't even do things that make us happy anymore. Yeah, it's true. We do increasingly live in a victim society. And yeah, we do. Let's talk about it. We live in a society. It's not fun to say. People don't want to hear it. But one of the things that I said, particularly when I said, talked about singles is, I'm sure your past relationship or your ex was bad. I have no questions about it. I want to know what was your role? What did you tolerate? What did you allow? And what are we going to do different next oh, time? Anything that. else focusing on your ex, focusing on what they did, focuses how bad or how terrible they were does not ultimately help you that much. You That's can right. acknowledge it. You can say, wow, I never should have allowed that or I should have walked away at this point. But then you fucking learn from it. And so many people are stuck in the blame. They can't get past it to get to the learning. You just nailed it. And um, to your point, the most precious asset on the planet is time. And okay. every moment you spend planning revisiting and reliving the past, reliving the future in a way that makes you unhappy is a moment that you can never get back. You can never recoup that. Time is nothing like money in that way. And we all want more money. I'll take more money. I'm sure you'll take more money. But time sure. is so much more valuable than money because money can be saved. You can earn compound interest off that money. So money that you didn't spend today, you can spend later and have more of it to spend later. Time that you do not spend well today, that you spend complaining or worrying or plotting or planning for a future that may or may not arrive, you have lost and you've lost forever. You cannot save it. You cannot earn compound interest on it. And you cannot enjoy it more later. So whatever's happened to you, I'm sorry. I really mean it. Right. And you're justified and legitimate to feel the way you do, but it's only messing up your current reality and your current life and your future life. Because we do know how you feel today prepaves how you're going to feel and do tomorrow. And so, for all those reasons, you want to take your power back and realize and recognize, look, listen, nobody said life was fair in that way at all. But happiness at the end of the day is an equal opportunity endeavor. And to be honest with you, some of the happiest people I know, in fact, I argue almost without exception, the happiest people I've known have gone through the darkest, deepest, most depressed experiences ever. And they've seen their way out of it because they've come to realize things about life at an, at an age where they still had life ahead of them. They discover things that most of us don't discover until we're on our deathbed, if then, right? They understand how precious and priceless the present moment is and how short life could be, but also how long it could be if you're miserable. So they don't waste a whole lot of time blaming other people, blaming other things, trying to control the people and things. Sure, politics matter, your parents matter, but also not that much. It doesn't matter that much. Do what you can to enjoy your life before it's over. Really look where we're putting our focus, where we're putting our time. Because truly, where we put our focus and our time is what we're going to keep creating. Yes. You and I know that. And it sounds like this frou-frou, woo-woo, whatever, this is now scientifically proven. That energetically, and honestly, just what we are constantly thinking about, we are going to keep creating over and over. And listen, I used to be the greatest advocate of complaining and telling it how it is and focusing on things that I wanted to, that I thought were wrong and fighting the good fight. And I've learned there's a better way. We don't realize it, but even when we think we're up to something good, that we're coming from a place of desperation or neediness or frustration or unhappiness, or we fear. float that very well-intentioned effort with all of that energy. And before mm -hmm. long, we wonder, how come people aren't joining my cause? Or how come people aren't getting on board? Or why do people continue to fight with me, even though I'm all about peace or whatever? But if you look closely, you discover you really haven't done a whole lot, except say you're about peace, while you continue to focus on stress or anxiety or overwhelm or frustration, and so it does require some practice. It's always helpful to lean into and leverage experts everywhere you can. If you can get in a group or community with people that are of like mind. Who like the Thrive Program? There is you go, yes. Where Rob is going to be teaching at least once and probably more because everybody loves access to his brain because I don't know. It's the smartest brain I know. Well, we share that brain because I feel that way about you. Kira, every time I talk to you, I'm blown away. And, and not just about these things, but about business related things and personal life stuff. So yeah, Kira, I think you've absolutely nailed it. The way I think about unhappiness, it's just unwanted thought. We can say a lot of stuff about it. It's just unwanted thought. And we're all always going to have some thoughts here and there that are unwanted. And the question is, what do you do with those thoughts? Can you observe them and let them go? Do you become convinced 
of whatever they're telling you is true and then you mm -hmm. lean in harder and then you try to fight them or you try to do something about whatever it is that they're convinced you is so wrong in the world. It's okay, part of that. But if you recognize that you can let go of unwanted thoughts, you can dismiss them, you can ignore them, you can find a place within yourself that's always quiet and still and silent and full of peace, you discover that not only do you feel better, but your life goes better. And that's the other part of psychology that's so fascinating. It's, you don't have to take the hard, long, indirect, scenic path to success. You can take a shortcut, a lazy, intelligent shortcut. You can find it. I'm cheaper. all about lazy, intelligent shortcuts. Yeah. Keep going. I'm sorry. No, you nailed it. We know that when you're unhappy, life is harder, not just because it feels harder, but because you actually create situations and conditions and circumstances and relationships in your life that make it harder. When you're yep. happier, you actually make more money. You save more money. You live longer. You live healthier lives. You attract people more easily and quickly and effortlessly. And then on top of that, you're actually enjoying your life so much more. So you feel better and do better, and you do it all by simply enjoying your present moments more deeply and fully. It's profound, yeah. actually. It is profound. And if you know how to do it, if you know how to add some of these small things in every day, and then more importantly, make them become a ritual. That's the thing. I think that they've recently come out with new research that they thought for a long time it took about three weeks to build a habit. Now they say... It's at least 66 days. That's the very minimum. And for some people, it can be up to a year. So most of the time for me, the, especially the ADHD version of me, I try something for about three, maybe four days. And I'm like, <laughs> did it stick? <laughs> Guess we're not doing it. I'm just not good at it. In that fixed mindset. And, and we just have to keep going. We have to keep going knowing that these small little behaviors can actually create huge impact in the long run. Oh, you nailed it. Practice might not make perfect. It does make for progress. And it's repetition over and over again. And it's prioritizing consistency over intensity. We all want to build Rome in a day. Mm -hmm. We want to become a Hall of Famer in a week. But it does take time. But that time doesn't have to be painful. It can be enjoyable. And that's the other piece of this that I feel is so important to share is that Yes, discipline matters, but again, there are lazy, intelligent shortcuts to getting yourself to do more of what you want to do or what you think would be helpful in your life, and it doesn't have to hurt. It can be enjoyable. It is. It does require some investment of time and energy and sometimes money, but you'd be surprised how much easier it is and how much more effective it is when you know the right way to do it. For a long time, I didn't. I just was trying to make it up on the fly for years, and it was so awful. Absolutely. And then you find out there's fucking science, but none of, but it wasn't around when we were kids. So to me, I keep looking at all of these people, not just women, but people our age and they're struggling so hard. And I'm like, it doesn't have to be this hard. It doesn't have to be this bad, but there's going to be some things you have to learn. There's some things that you're going to have to put into your life that feel not intuitive in some ways, because we've been taught so many weird ass things along the way. And so- intuition with familiarity it's yep. not familiar and then we think it's not intuitive but no it's quite the opposite we've been taught a familiar way of doing things that is counterintuitive itself yes and attraction is mostly a familiarity and people don't know that or recognize that wayne dyer tells a story that speaks to that poignantly he used to tell a story because he grew up in foster homes and i don't know if i knew that yeah he grew up in foster homes and he said, as he got older, he started noticing there'd be like these little babies that would that were abused, abused by their parents, really sad and disturbing. And he said, but when they tried to take this abused child away from their maternal father or mother or whomever, child caretaker, the little baby would scream at the top of its lungs. Like it was, of course it did, because it was the familiarity. It was so scary to step into this new space where you could be treated better and healthier and happier and have a happier life. But the familiarity, it, it, it's so sticky and as an adult, we're still like those little kids often. Even though we're in a situation that's unhealthy or unhappy, we prefer it than to take that step out into the unknown and at least explore the possibility of having a happier, healthier life or relationship. And I do have to, while you're here, have you, because this was the other thing off of that first call that we did that I was like, I'm sorry, what? And I remember that you telling me, because I think that particularly in the States, we get really caught up on financial success. 
owning things, owning a nice house, owning a nice car, owning a nice, and not just because we want to enjoy them because of how it also looks externally. And you told me that the average person in the world, I think it was 15. 15. If you have $15 in your bank account, you have more than, I think it was 80% yes. in the world. Yes. And I think that's a great reality check for all of us working so hard, living for work, that in a way that I think it really exists in our generation in a way. I love seeing the younger generations being like, oh, no, I'm done at five. I will not be answering your those emails. Yeah. I will not. And I hear yes. people my age who are managers or administrators and going, how dare they? I'm like, don't we want that for them? <laughs> don't we want our kids and our grandkids to not work at the level that we did and the way that our parents did? Or aren't we trying to create a better world? And we're like bitter about it. Well, yeah, it's interesting because we want to justify our misery. And, and, the, and this is a big challenge in my own private practice. I'm sure it was a challenge when I was on the other end of this. But sometimes we don't want to consider that there's a better, happier, healthier alternative because it means that most of how we've lived our life has either been wrong or misguided or we are misled. And it also means that we might have to look more closely at how we're living now and make some major changes. And that scares people. Change can scare people because they make up stories. We all make up stories about what change means and how painful it's going to be. So you've hit something huge there, uh, Kira, which, gosh, boundaries are great. Also, we think that we're so smart. We're so smart and civilized as human beings, so much smarter than the rest of the animal kingdom or the rest of nope. all the living creatures. But if you look into, and look into nature, most of nature, despite experiencing the same accidents, misfortune, illness, death, and loss. Predators. Predators. So much happier, so much more blissful, so much more peaceful than human beings. And they work so much less. Look at your cat or your dog or look out into the world and look at the birds. They just are perfectly lazy most of the day, perfectly lazy, and yet live so much more peacefully and blissfully. So, you know, when in doubt, take a tip from nature, go sit and observe nature a little, and you'll see how backwards and inside out the way we live our lives often is. And it also speaks to the opportunity that exists for us to live a much you know, more peaceful, happier, healthier, and even more successful and prosperous life. I think that one of the greatest things that's happened to me in this age is that I've just started pushing back on what I knew. I, just, I think it took mm. me till this time, till this level of either knowing or self-awareness or confidence or whatever it is for me to be like, actually, no, that's not okay. Or no, this thing that I've been told over and over and over and over my whole life is not real. It's not a real thing. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, but what you know, it just ain't so. Right? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love it. It's And I think so many of us are confused, but what I'm so constantly excited about is that positive psychology, it's only been around for about 25 years now, I think 1999, right? But it answers so many questions that we have that we're asking, and yet none of us are really doing it. There's a small portion of people who get it, but I know for a fact that there is no way I would be doing as well as I'm doing during a tough time with my hormones and perimenopause and all this other stuff where I cry 18 times a day. If I didn't have some of the stuff in place, if I wasn't able to step back and go, okay, I just need to meditate for about two or three minutes just to get my head back, my mind back, get my emotions back to a, a calm. And I was going to say, when you're talking about animals, recently I was reading about how much better animals process emotions. It's instant, right? Like they react to the danger or whatever is happening around them, and then they go back to the calm state. We never go back to the calm state. You nailed it. You're right. Imagine being living in a jungle somewhere, a forest somewhere, and being tracked, like, tracked and chased by a mountain lion or a tiger or a bear. Like, literally, Im imagine imagine that being a daily experience for you as a deer, okay? Oh, my God. We, the PT I'd hide. I would just never come out, right? As humans, I think we would just be like, oh, my God, I would hide. I would never come out. I would never want to be. That's not possible. Animals like, oh, I'm going to get out of this situation, and now I'm good. Yes. Until tomorrow. That's right. They don't carry all that trauma in the body and therefore have to go to therapy for it and all this, right? So, <laughs> yes. And so it's interesting because we do have a functional and functioning psychological and emotional immune system in the same way that we have a physiological and biological one. We, we do. And the only challenge and problem is that we often get in the way of that healthy psychological and emotional immune system, like kicking in and working well for us. We do things that get that gets in the, in the way. So we want to return to that sort of innate, inherent 
the state of peace and love and happiness and healthy psychological and emotional functioning. And we can do it, but it helps to have guidance and direction and some folks that have been there and done it. I just, yeah, I think that I am 100% part of the problem that for the first at least, I don't know, year, I'm like, oh, I can figure this out myself. Or maybe yeah. now it's like more like now it used to be I can just figure this out by myself. Then I started going, OK, I don't think I can figure this out by myself, but I'm going to try real hard or I'm just going to read a bunch of articles online and think that's going to do it for me. Wait, we see you hit something there. And this is the challenge if you nailed it, which is that there's a problem with thinking you could figure it out yourself because figuring it out yourself is the problem, like the figuring out piece. Right. Because so much of it is seemingly counterintuitive, like you said. So for instance, a lot of what I've discovered about happiness is that happiness is all about not figuring it out. It's about feeling it through or feeling it out. Not overthinking, yeah. which is what we do so we don't have to feel our feelings. That's right. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When all you have is a brain or all you think you have is a brain, everything looks like a problem to be solved. So you're always trying to solve these problems, you're trying to get to the end of the internet. Like you're trying to beat this game of whack-a-mole. That is life, by the way, because as soon as you solve one problem, another problem pops up. So the only way to solve the game of whack-a-mole is pull up the plug on the entire game. You don't beat it by, by catching every single mole and whacking it. And so that's what most of us end up doing. We say, well, I can figure this thing out. And you know what? Lo and behold, you can figure this thing out and you figure that thing out. But you actually never really solve or end the game of whack-a-mole, which is life, because you don't know or think to look for where the plug is to actually pull the plug. What's really going on, the yeah. bigger picture, right. are overall belief system or overall perspectives and biases that have been around since you were seven, right. by the way, 95%, I love saying this, 95% of what we think and is an automatic thought, those were created by the age of seven. So it's the same old tapes, the same old record, the same old song playing over and over again in your head, convincing Until you we think more it's of what work before. Yeah. Rob, I can't say enough how happy I am that you are here today. I love talking to you here. I never want to go. <laughs> Let me be clear. I never want to I go. Know. And I will talk to you and I look forward to talking to you again and again. This conversation I hope will never end. I can't imagine it ever ending. It will. I have such deep gratitude for you, Kira. Not just the work you do, but who you are and where that work comes from. Like your heart is so pure. You're so generous. You have nothing but the best intentions. And you've really genuinely done the work for decades now. I mean, you've done it over and over again. And I've seen the transformation, not only in myself, but in other people. And so I just feel so privileged and honored to be a part of the conversation, to be connected with you and to be a witness to all the good stuff that I see happening with you and through you. Good thing I'm not going to cry right now or anything like that. <laughs> I love you to pieces. Thank you, Rob, for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. Wasn't that so fucking good? I know. I just edited that episode and just learned like four new things myself. Shit. That's the kind of thing that I'm doing here. We get so stuck in the day to day, the minutia, the, the stuff that honestly doesn't really matter. And until we get a wake up call, which I think that midlife really fucking is, we can stay in that cycle for years. I think sometimes decades where we don't ever lift up our heads and go, am I happy? Is this, is this, is this it? And is this all I'm going to be or do? I'm starting to feel I'm so fucking excited about this program. And I'm so, I'm starting to feel like this next chapter might be even better than the last one. And I think one of the hardest things about turning 50 and I'm going to say as a woman, but maybe this is not just as a woman, is that it is bored into our brain that as we age, our worth in this society goes away. And so starting sometimes in our 30s or maybe our 40s, and maybe we're really, really trying to fight it, there's this realization that what I've been told matters about me, how I look, my birthing area. And the fact that I can reproduce, all that shit is going away. But something about the conversations I'm having, and by the way, Rob is my first, but I plan on talking to a bunch of other people about how, how we just do life better, how we start 
adding in little things that can actually make it better because it's real and we're not doing it. And you're probably beating yourself up over it. I wanted to read something to you guys really quickly because I have been behind the scenes putting together what's probably going to be like a hundred page workbook for the Thrive program, writing it out myself, a bunch of new activities, a bunch of new things. And I've been digging hard into all of my former positive psychology work, going through all my slides and my resources and everything else. And I came across this yesterday and I just, I did not remember this. Hands down, did not remember this or I would have been shouting this from the mountaintops for the last seven or eight years since I started working in positive psychology. But they actually did a test of severely depressed patients randomly assigned to either positive psychology infused with psychotherapy, therapy with positive psychology in it, or therapy as usual. And then they also took a group of equally depressed patients who went through therapy with an antidepressant. I don't think I'm saying this very well. Because it's written, you know how sometimes just academic and sciencey stuff is, is made harder than it seems to need to be? So saying this, they basically took two groups and they took two severely depressed groups. And one of them did therapy with positive psychology and the other one did therapy with antidepressants. And by the way, I'm on an antidepressant. I would never tell people to go off antidepressants. I would never tell you to do something like that. However, what I think is very interesting is that... A year later, positive psychology relieved depressive symptoms on all outcome measures better than just therapy by itself and better than therapy with drugs one year later. That's why I'm saying this is the next step after therapy. And if you're in therapy, and by the way, talk to your therapist about it. Do you think I'm ready to learn some of this stuff? Because if they say no, maybe next year. But this is real. These things are fucking real. And the craziest thing is that when I realized that depression was not just this thing that I had forever and was never going to really go away unless I somehow medicated it. And I realized there were little things I could do that could just lift me up a little bit, even on my toughest days. It matters. It fucking matters. But back to being told and watching society tell me that my worth is diminishing. And I don't think it's the same story we're saying to men. Now, we're saying a lot of other shitty things to men. But I don't fucking care if they think my worth is diminishing. Because the only fucking person who can give me worth is me. And they don't get my worth. They don't get to tell me when I am worthy. They don't get to tell me when my time is over or done. I am just getting started. I am just getting started to put myself out there and change as many lives. Because I'm fucking worried about us. Part of me six months ago thought about getting a job. I started looking at jobs online and I would cry every night to Danny. Oh, guys, it was so rough. Because I'm like, I just love this so much and I'm really fucking good at it. I don't want to give this up yet. And there's so much more work to be done. But I pulled myself through. Here I am. And I'm just getting started. I hope you're just getting started with me. Whatever your age, whatever your gender. If you don't like your life you can change it. And you don't have to upheaval the whole fucking thing. You don't need to leave your relationship. You need to leave your job. You don't need to move to France. You just might need a different perspective, some different mindsets, and some skills to make this all a little bit easier. That's what I'm doing here. All right, guys. Well, I already have three more episodes in the can that'll probably be coming out over the next week or so if you're ready in 2025 who thinks that seems weird wow 
in 2025 if you're ready to change your life. Change it with me! Let's do this! Let's fucking do this! I'm so excited! I'm so excited. There is now a 10-part payment plan. Figure it out. Come talk to me. We're going to jump on a call. And by the way, if it's not a good match, if I'm like, you know what? This isn't what you need right now. I will tell you. I'm that person. All right, guys. That's it for today. If you liked this, please subscribe. I don't always put things out weekly. Sometimes I put things out three times a week. Sometimes I'll have a week and a half to two weeks in between. So subscribe so you know exactly when things go live. Finally, if you really love it, please leave a review. Whether it's just some stars on Apple or Spotify or really writing down what you are learning and loving about this podcast. I read every single one. They fucking make my day. You are the wind beneath my wings and it helps get it out there. Because honestly, as much as I can say this for as much feedback I get about this podcast, which is a lot and most of it all very positive, except for the people who don't like my swearing and don't fucking care. Even if you never share this with another person, by you writing an anonymous review, that lets other people know this might be something that they want to check out. All right, guys. I'm actually probably going to be back in a few days with one of my guests to talk about perimenopause, to talk about emotional regulation, to talk about some of these things a little more deeply so we can learn what to do and then how to apply. I'll see you soon.